<laughs> so I guess I started uh, really young with two VCRs, like back in the day. Um, skateboarding and snowboarding, we film each other, shooting stuff, and I figured out that I could edit by playing on one and recording on another. So I think I stole my mom's VCR from her room upstairs and went downstairs and like plugged them all together. And that was really like where I started understanding how to put stuff together and even just seeing like an edit for the first time, like, oh, it like, makes sense from this, moving to this room to that room, you know, like very, very basic stuff. And then I guess when I was in college, I bought an Apple and a Panasonic DVX, and I started shooting as much stuff as I could, and would just edit, just trying to learn Final Cut. And then one thing led to another, and now I'm here, I guess, really. <laughs> Um, I guess I really got into editing in college. I went to school for film and, you know, kind of did the whole gamut of everything and kept finding myself gravitating towards post-production and editing and decided to kind of focus on that. So by the time I graduated, I knew that was my main thing that I wanted to do and pursued that on job assisting and got into the union and kind of went a very traditional route of working up the ranks in TV. Um, I think I first edited a, a, edited a project, I guess, it was Die Hard. Um, there was a special DVD that came out that you could like recut part of the scene, I think, on disc two. Like they gave you like three scenes and then you like choose different angles and stuff. And when you're a kid, you're like, what? Like, that's crazy. So I, I now I'm thinking about it, like that was like the first movie I ever cut, was Die Hard. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, I mean, everyone like I was like you know always wanted to do film and stuff growing up as a kid. But when DVDs came out and all, when people started putting out all these special features on like how the movie got made, then I really started getting into like I guess what it, what the director does, what the cinematographer does, and all this editing. Yeah, DVDs changed the way you think about it. <laughs> That's the way I thought about stuff growing up. Like, oh. Like, I started editing basically when I was a little kid playing around with like my parents' VHS cameras, like doing the editing camera. And then Final Cut Pro in high school was like a revelation because you're like, oh my god, I actually edit something. And then like, I guess professionally I got my start. I was an assistant editor on Pearl Jam 20 and then um, started cutting stuff on my own without anyone, anyone's permission and then they made me an editor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good advice. <laughs> Be really good. Just do, do what you want to do. <laughs> um, so let's get into kind of the process a little bit. Um, and this might be across the board, but this also might vary. Where do you come in to the process as an editor? Like, when, when are you usually brought on board, and how much like influence do you have during production, or is it all in post, or is what has that experience been for you? Um, I'll pass that one to you. <laughs> I don't normally, well, I mean, I don't normally, I don't necessarily just edit, you know what I mean? So I edit a lot of the stuff that I direct, and in that regard, it's like, I, I, the day one I decide to do something, it's like, I'm also the editor, you know what I mean? Lately, it's been an interesting thing for me to hire other editors, to like pass on that and to work with somebody collaboratively, that's been an interesting thing, because normally, you know, I was a little worried about it, them not doing the way I wanted to do it in my head, but it's like I can still, it's been quite an interesting process and to be able to sort of like have the project grow into something a little bit different. You know, they have a, their own perspective, so it's been beneficial, I guess. Um, but coming into something for an editor, that, that I don't know. Yeah, I think it really varies on the project and what you're doing. I know for things that are smaller budget or shorts or independent stuff I've done, I'm usually on board before they start shooting. That doesn't necessarily mean I spend all my time on set, but I'm, I usually help them figure out the workflow, what they're gonna need, and get that all squared away. For TV, it's much more standard in that they usually don't bring the editor on until the day, uh, a couple days before they start shooting. So the editor is there from the time they start shooting to the beginning, but they're not, um, they'll go to tone meetings and read scripts, and they're a little bit involved in the production, but not heavily involved. But I can actually add, sorry not to go, I can actually go. add from the other yeah. perspective of that. Uh, I'm producing a TV show, and we shot everything in the fall, and we're starting post on Monday, and as of today, we have no editors. So <laughs> in that regard, very, very, very last minute, right? So it's possible in this TV world, we're doing a reality show for Annie, and there's nobody on board. Uh, I'm trying to work on a documentary, and the very first person I met with was an editor. 
dinner. So we had dinner, I pitched him the idea, we talked about what it was, and he gave me feedback. So it really, you know, that's like the very first meeting, or it's like we're starting in three days yeah, and there's nobody on board. It can be anything, and I think also depends on the personal relationships. So yeah, I mean, the editor, yeah, the editor's a friend of mine, and I know he's very involved in the topic that we're, we want to cover, so it's like, it makes a lot of sense, you know what I mean? So it, it varies quite a bit. That's interesting, that, you know, I don't know what it is about working with people that you trust, especially when you're handing it off to an editor. Like I feel like the like the that relationship with the director already needs to already be there in, on some sort of level, or yeah. you need to like win them over with a lunch or something like, <laughs> because it, it's almost like you're, it, uh, it's a child. You know, when you hand someone your child, you don't want them to just drop the, <laughs> the thing. You're like, because then because you know what you have and it's very special, and then you get an editor anyway. I'm rambling about babies and. Footage and that kind of thing. <laughs> no, but it's true. It's so true. Yeah. I feel like it when because I edit a lot of stuff that I direct and stuff, and when I do, and I because I, I really feel like I have like a trust issue. Like I, I almost don't feel like I trust like someone to put it together necessarily the way that I see it, and that's why like I started editing back in high school was like someone else would take it and be like, ah, oh, no, like, <laughs> that's not how like the story needs to be told, and if they don't do that, then. What are you watching it for? There's no, you're not telling the story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway. So I, fun, yeah. yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, it is, because, like, this is kind of a tangent question. But, like, editing <laughs> is, a lot of it's about trusting. Like, editors are usually seen, in, like, I, I've met a lot of editors that are seasoned that are, like, Zen masters, because when you're in post, it's like directors are usually so high strung and self conscious because it's their last chance to really make it good. And as an editor, like, the best editors, I think, are people that are really calm and can, uh, like, like simultaneously, like, therapists <laughs> and, like, artists. Because you have to, like, you have to, like, foster, like, the insecurities of everyone else that you're working with and then also know what to do. Another thing you have to remember, too, is post is where everyone's confronted with their mistakes and exactly. things that they couldn't achieve or couldn't get, and they have to kind of reconcile that. So, you know, you have to be very gentle. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. That's really funny because our last cinematography panel, John Skimmon, uh, was like, you do have, you are, the cinematographer is often therapist to the director during the back. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sorry if we screw them up and then pass them to you. <laughs> You're like the parents. <laughs> Create the so it's your turn. You're taking it for this yeah. weekend. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, well, speaking of working with directors, we have a lot of aspiring directors and that kind of stuff. And one thing I'd like to, to ask is, um, what can directors do or learn to be a good collaborator in the edit room? And then what would you offer editors advice to to be a good collaborator with a director? It, it's a very like passionate relationship, so it can vary per person, but like. Yeah, I think. Um, Knowing the process from both sides is really important in terms of understanding when each person can reach the table. You know, there's a lot of trust that goes into it, and having respect for each other's roles is really important. So I feel like, from an editing perspective, if a director comes in that doesn't really understand how the post process works, and doesn't really understand what your role is, it can be very off-putting, and it makes it much harder to feel like you're having a collaborative relationship. And uh, but vice versa, you don't. The editor should never act. They're above the project either or superior to it. You've got to leave ego at the door. Yeah, I think for aspiring directors, if you're trying to direct, like the more you know about every single aspect of production, the better off you're going to be. If you know about like makeup and hair, it's like you can see what you want and identify it, and you can save time and like just get everybody on the same page. I found for me, like knowing about editing, like I was a much more proficient editor before I started directing, and on set. I was calling shots being done because I knew I wasn't going to need something or I knew I was going to need something. So it made the day go a lot faster, which was a lot, very, very helpful because it's like you never have enough time and if I can cut shots out because I know I'm cutting it and I know I don't need that shot, then it really, really helps. And that just came from an understanding of knowing what I was using for me. And that, you know what I mean? So I think the more you know, the better because then it's like when you start working with somebody, you, you can have that respectful relationship because that's important. Like, working in the room, you're going to be in that room, be it for three days or three months, like, you don't want to be at each other's throats, you know what I mean? <laughs> Never fun like that. Yeah. I guess my advice to directors would be to, like, 
Like, I love it when directors know what they want in terms of what they're trying to say. Um, and then I like trying to figure out how to say that with, with the editing. Like, and so I think it's like the best collaborations I've had are when the director has a really big idea. It's like, I want it to be about this thing. Like, whatever it is, it's a documentary or a feature or whatever. And the editor's role is like taking what they got and then shaping it into that thing, like as close as they can. You know, and then it's this conversation back and forth. I really like how you put that, like, you figure out how to say it. Because I think there's a difference between knowing what you want and coming in with, like, a mental shot list. Yeah. Because it's not so much knowing I want this take here and that take here. It's knowing how, you, like, the tone and the feeling and the character and the story and coming in with an open mind and letting an editor kind of show you a way to tell that. Yeah, because editor, our job is like the mechanics of like shot per shot. Yeah. There's like the little little like cut for cut editing, and then there's like the what's the scene about, you know, and that's that's ideally the director's role, right? Not always, but yeah. should be. Yeah, because I think if you come in like with this pre-imagined how it's gonna go and look, you're not really opening yourself up to all these other possibilities that are out there. That's what I. That's what I think right there is like what I would. To, to sort of address the question, it would be, yeah, to basically leave yourself open to any possibility when you're still in the editing room. I know with the director, if the director has that vision, like that's awesome too. And then you come in and you say, well, well, we have this great thing here, and then you can find like really happy accidents that no one was expecting, but then that's how you open the scene or something. And, uh, and being able to like not be so precious yet yet specific. It's it's a weird dance that you have to do with the director and as an editor and all this stuff. And I remember on season three, uh, in the script, I, w I was like, oh gosh, I don't even know how to start the scene. And in the script it said like, oh, well, uh, the scene opens with uh, Brian D dancing to doo -wop. And so the scene is only like, the scene description is like that big on the page. I was like, oh, well, doo -wop is specifically in this script. So I just carried it into the next scene, thinking like, well, why else would he just have doo-wop for like two seconds? And then I just started cutting to this doo-wop song, and that sort of helped me. Like, and then uh, and then Matt was like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" You know, it's like, well, I mean, I thought you wrote this. Like, I thought this was what you wanted. He's like, "No, no, I no idea." He was no so idea. happy. Yeah. He was so happy. And so and then so like, it's it's a weird dance between just sort of yeah. I don't know, man. Like that stuff, you like yeah, you yeah. can't really figure out how to explain that, but it just sort of feels right, and that's <laughs> and editing is also a lot about just like whatever feels right. So totally, that's yeah. just yeah. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. It's a place where you can really like, do whatever you want as long as it works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone just uh, read friggin' messaged me or something with quotes. They tweeted, and I, I barely use Twitter, but I got a notification that said. And someone quoted me, and I was like, I said that? But the quote was, uh, I said something along the lines of, I like editing because I can make people and things make sense. Or, something, <laughs> or I, can make, I can make people make sense. Yeah, yeah. And just making sense out of nonsense or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I was like, I said that? Weird. I mean, that's more insightful than I thought I'd ever be in my life. But it's, that's, and that's a good kind of segue into um, uh, another question that often comes up when I'm talking to young filmmakers. is like, how do I cut together a scene? How do I know it works? And one interesting thing that has come up in talking and brainstorming for film school is that the same kind of rules for screenwriting and, and story kind of apply to your edit, where each scene has like a beginning, middle to end, and that kind of stuff. So when you guys are going to cut a scene, um, how, what's your kind of approach like, and, and, and does it vary, and, and how, per scene, like how do you know when it kind of like works and clicks for you? That's a really like. That's a, that's a hard question. It's a hard right. one. The, the most general answer is experience. Like the more you cut, the more you'll start to identify what works and what doesn't. I mean, yeah, you definitely want to break it down into like a beginning, a middle, and then there's a million sort of technical things that you can do. But I think if you cut like for three years straight, on that fourth year, the first thing you cut, like you're gonna know it works. You just you watch and you're like, okay, this feels right, and you have a better understanding for how to make it work because. Like you said, so you can do whatever you want as long as it works. So there's sometimes there's not like fewer parameters than you would think, um, and I would just say experience. Like the more you cut, the better you're gonna understand when it works and when you're nailing the things that you wanted to do, and then you could. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's definitely certain rules like there is with any craft that you can follow. And if you don't know where to start, that's usually a good place to start. And then you can branch off and go crazy from there. But uh, in terms of whether or not something's working, I think you're totally right. It's just experience. And a lot of what I do sometimes is like you can change your perspective on it, like even physically or you know, bringing someone else into the room that you trust, even if they don't give you feedback, just being aware of someone being there watching it can change how you see it, or turning off the sound, or turning up music, or whatever. And I guess another thing is, if it's like a scene, like a beginning, middle, end, like you said, the story, you kind of, you can always stop and think, like, who's this thing about? And how is that shaping a lot that I think people just do on instinct. You know, you don't have to overthink it, but. Yeah, I would say that's the, the bigger question really is like what to do when it's not working. Yeah. Like when it works, you're like, I, well, I get it, this, yeah. this works. But like when you're in the room and it's been like a day and you're looking yeah. at this and you're like, this does not work. And for you to figure it out, I think that's a great that's, answer. Yeah, that's really The perspective good. switch is great. Like either show it to someone or try to think about it from a different angle because it's like more than likely you've been like looking at it in this one way the whole time. You're like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. And then if you can switch it up in some regard, it might not necessarily be the answer, but it might let you like lead you down a path to figure out the answer. And then you'll watch it, oh, it works now. No, no, that's good. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like if I overthink something before I start it, it's always worse than if I just like go oh, yeah. at it yeah. and then try to figure it out after it. So. Mm -hmm. Like reverse engineer why yeah. it's not doing what you want then it to like do. Then like try yeah. to plot it out too much. Yeah. yeah, no, I've, I've tried every every possible way to approach a thing. Diving right in is very effective. <laughs> Diving right in is very effective, just to get started, I think. And then if you get, and then you get only so far, and then you're like, Ugh, you can't do it anymore. And then you, then I, if I get stuck, I like go back to the script. And I'm like, and then I just try and picture what it would look like in the script. And then I look, and I'm like, please tell me they shot the same or they shot, you know, <laughs> you're going through and you see what you got, and then, and then I'm like, oh great, that's what I, that's, I need that. Uh, yeah, so then, you just trying to keep uh, the momentum going. And, yeah, I get stuck a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Go make a sandwich. Back in Final Cut days, like I spent a lot of my time rendering, so I would just that would like be a time where I'd get up and like go stretch my legs or make a sandwich or something. Dude. And then when I render it, and then I, I look at it and nothing, I'm like, oh, it didn't work. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> but I like try it again and like wait 30 minutes for something to render. I'm like, oh, go do something else. And you're just unsure if it's working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and kind of going off that, how many, like, there's kind of this uh, pressure with filmmakers to, like, do the best job right out of the get-go, but <laughs> we all know that editing, there are drafts. Like, how, what's the biggest amount of rough drafts that you have done on a project? Oh. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally thousands. Yeah, I'm a huge rough drafter. Yeah. I'm, I'm big on duplicating sequences because I'm terrified that I did something brilliant like five <laughs> cuts ago and forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. So like, if you look at like a bang on something I'm working on, it's just like I just duplicate constantly and end up with like every. Yeah. Some people don't do that. No, yeah. well, well, especially for docs, for me, because oh, like, yeah. docs are like written in the editing room. Like, you literally sift through, but sometimes thousands of hours of footage and figure out what's going on and then shaping the scenes. Like, I've gone through, I mean, it took me two years to cut the Pearl Jam movie, and that went, that went through thousands of drafts of, of, of a movie. Yeah. So. I yeah, I remember being on the phone with you once to catch up, and I was driving home, and I was like, Ke like Kevin, like, how's, how's it going? And you're like, <laughs> I was like, what is happening? And you were, yeah, you were on that for a couple of years. Yeah, for a long time. It just boggled my mind that, like, your brain was able to hold that much. It was. <laughs> That's why we have computers. <laughs> to organize my uh, yeah. That was the question. Drafts. Um, Drafts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, with uh, what, what's interesting with uh, coming from five second films is we would send out maybe three or four versions of the same film with different punchlines or different jokes. And, and like those would be really interesting to dissect and be like, oh, well, I like the performance in this one, or, 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 or you understand the, uh, the punchline better in that one. Uh, let me think of an example. Oh, one, okay, well, 
One is just called police intimidation. It's with Brian Ferenzi in trying to intimidate a suspect by flashing him a dildo. And he's like, why don't you, why don't you try this one for size? And he says stuff like that over and over. Anyway, that's really inappropriate. But that was, <laughs> but, but they did so many different takes, so you can get so many different jokes out of different punchlines, right? So, so we would just cut like a thousand versions of the same joke, but with different punchlines and things. And, We'd all just sort of vote. We were very democratic in, in what we thought was funniest, and then that's the one that would go up. You know, so uh, very interesting. I haven't worked with anyone else that just would recut a five seconds so many times. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing too to be aware of is that when you're the director and the editor, it's like you can approve your cut like first draft, <laughs> which is problematic because it's like I'll do something I'm like, oh, this is good, I like it, but it's like. It doesn't go through the process of like you know revisions and reviews and which is really necessary you know what I mean and so you have to have like that diligence to be like send it to people or to like t just take a break and to come back to it to like really have kind of have a critical eye because that dynamic is really important of having another person's perspective on it when you're working with an editor um, and when you can approve your own cut what like, rough cuts it's like that doesn't really help you get a better product it's like you just be lazy and you're like oh I'm done <laughs> but um. So yeah, so I would, you know, it's always good to just send them out and get other eyes and try to take people's advice on it. And this even happened, I, I did a little like cover video, I shot a friend's, like they performed a song or whatever, and um, they couldn't release it, we still haven't released it yet, we shot it like three weeks ago. And normally I would just edit it real quick and be like, okay, it's three, two, one, I'm just gonna put it out there. But because we're on this delay and we're waiting for this thing, like I've constantly gone back and I've, made revisions and made it better like every single time and I would never do that but giving yourself that time to go through it and to sit with it it really helps make your project better you know what I mean sometimes you don't have that luxury but like when you do like definitely take advantage of it and try not to be lazy because I've been lazy just like yeah that's good enough I'll prove it you know? <laughs> so Like editing is one of those things that, and this came up in the cinematography panel too, is that you, um, it's one of those invisible arts, is that you shouldn't notice the editing if you're watching a movie. Um, but there are, there are directors that work with the same cinematographer and the same editor just constantly. And, and, and one of the questions I got before was, how do you know, like, do editors have a certain style? Like, do you have any, is there some sort of signature to your own work? Is, there, is that apparent to you? What would you say your style would be? And is this something that shows up in the cut or is it more about the process? I think everybody develops your own style. And I think for me, even both as a director and an editor, it, you want to have a style, like it's cool. You're like, oh, I have a style, or this, or that. And, I was sort of, when I was starting out a little bit more, I was a little uh, just concerned about what that might be or trying to define it or something like that. And I think that was problematic where really it like it develops just over time. Like, you know, if I cut a reel maybe a year or two ago after it had a bunch of stuff on it and I and I saw some similarities in, across different projects over different years. You know, and I'm like, oh, like, I guess it's just there. You know what I mean? And so after you sort of amass a body of work, you know, you do things and you make choices because you like them, and I think your style comes from that. So I wouldn't be too concerned about defining what that is. You know, you figure it out as you go through, and I think the same thing goes with an editor. It's like they make certain choices, and over time, it's like certain styles kind of just emerge. And, and, but I think as far as working with the same person, it's all, for me, like, a, a, it's a personal thing. If I get along with them, if we make good work together, there's no reason to upset that. And like, it's, you know, their style is just that thing that they bring the table and if I enjoy working with them then that's kind of what's going to keep it going. Yeah, I think um, everything is ultimately at the service of the story you're trying to tell and so in terms of like a very visual discernible style that usually can be very fluid and change but I definitely noticed that because everything's so personal and everything's such a matter of personal opinions, different people tend to gravitate towards different things and like, working as an assistant for a lot of different editors that I would cut for them and get notes from them. Like I know like one editor that I work for, like he, I always cut scenes much tighter for him because he's always about pace, pace, pace and keeping things tight. And there's other editors that are much looser. So I think on the inside of the process, like you can notice like personal status of things. 
but it's not always so visible with the final product. I, I, it's it's hard. I mean, I it's weird to say that you have a style because yeah, I feel like that or it, no, it's totally understandable to have a style to it. But I, I just keep thinking of like what the story is, and really, if if it's it's oh, man, I'm so blown away by just all the possibilities of editing that I, I it's. Uh, I want to have a style, but I also don't want to like cut for the sake of cutting, which I've seen a lot of people do, and and so I get more I get more critical. Like when I watch other people's stuff, I, I'm very critical and like why did they do that when there when there wasn't necessarily a reason to. And I was like, well, I'm not learning anything new by just showing me this. Like, and, you should never anyway, cut. I get make a cut. Yeah. So I, yeah, I guess I'm basically I'm looking at it now as like a critical perspective. It's like when I'm when I'm say if I were a director like critiquing an edit, I'm very much looking at like what the motivation was to do certain choices and but that doesn't that doesn't address style. It's just a weird I don't know. It's a weird style blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> like it, yeah. I don't well, it's understand. Like, eh, it's like. Painters have styles because they're making all these choices about what colors to Like you said, editor too, because you're choosing your shots. Yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's all, like subtle stuff. Like, Every person is a different person with different yeah. stops and videos. I mean, like, <laughs> if I had to define my style as an editor, it would be just like I try to cut with intention mm -hmm. as much as possible. And sometimes that means that it's like you can see the hand of the editor in my cuts. Like, mm -hmm. Like I know that in the Pearl Jam doc, like there's like a whole crazy section at the end. It's just like really fast cutting, and it's intentionally like you, you notice the cutting because it's like really fast. Right. Um, but it's all done with the intention of, of building up how many years these guys have played music together. So it, it has intention, and, it, and because of that, the editing like it draws attention to itself, but it's okay. You know. It has a purpose. Yeah, I'm not sure where the film like gets off the train or whatever way. In terms of style, if it's like I don't know if it's the director's style specifically or the editor's style, because like you know I'm thinking like Edgar Wright and stuff, all those like quick cuts that he has in his movies. Is that his style or his editor's style, and, or how do they like they they sort of came up with that own like their own little montage way of doing things? You know that's very unique to a film, but I don't know like who to attribute that to. Do I give that to Edgar Wright or do it is it it's the, editor. the the editor? <laughs> <laughs> then, then, Bada bing, then that is a cool style. I like that style. I, wouldn't, I didn't know who to, who to thank for and that. And the editor has to be able to make it work, too. Like, even if someone like Edgar Wright is like, I want to be like this, like, you still have to intuitively know how to make that work. Right. Yeah, I think uh, one, of, uh, one of the gappers I worked with a while ago kind of summed it up best when he's like, the best collaborations are when you do something cool and everyone says, who did that? <laughs> no one knows exactly who came up with the idea or like how it came together, but everyone together made something pretty awesome. I, think that's a, I thought that was a cool summary. Oh, that's so nice. like, um, do you guys have a favorite editor and or movie? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. It changes. Whatever you know, editors, would you have um, movie or editor recommendations to like if people want to Watch some good films by like a cl like a pretty well known editor. Like, would you have any recommendations? On the flip side, I think it's really interesting to take something that you totally love and like zero in on the editing choices <laughs> because it's speaking to you for a reason, you know. And you think about what they're doing that's making you love it. One one thing I've done too was I've watched movies on mute yeah. and just pay attention to the editing and try to understand. Um, it just, you know, you get you get so caught in the story, you just like in five seconds you forget that you're watching a movie, you get immersed. I think it's really good to just watch something very critically, um, and it, it does help to know the movie too. Like if you know the movie and then you watch it on silent, you sort of know what's going on in the storyline, and you start understanding where they're making cuts, how long they're holding up shots, and what they're doing on a technical level, and that has been pretty insightful on stuff. You know what I mean? So that's a good little trick to do. I second that, definitely. <laughs> watch movies on mute and like learn how to tell the story visually, you know. And as an editor, like that's very, it's a very good thing to be aware of um, visual storytelling, uh, and that's your your job. Yeah, do it, do it well. And even if it's not like flashy, I mean, just watching performances on mute and how they're choosing to have people interact with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, Memento. Memento is an interesting concept. You know, I'm sure you guys have all seen it. That I mean, I hadn't seen a film that was sort of structured quite so unique. And gosh, I wonder. Like, I, I know you could watch the film linearly, like all in one go. But the it's I don't know. There's something about having your brain pick up where a scene left off or something that you're just doing. Like, it's on a whole subconscious level now. That's a really weird exercise, but yeah, watch it again, maybe. Compare the two, watch it all the way through, like chronologically, and then watch it cut up, or I don't know. Yeah, it's talking about performances too. It's like sometimes, you know, it's like not cutting just a cut. It's like Birdman and Gravity, you know what I mean? It's like Birdman didn't cut, I mean, it did technically, but it's like, yep. you know, that whole, it's a whole, it's just one shot, right? And it's like, it just goes to, and that, just goes to show you that you know you can be entertained and enthralled in the story without cutting. Like you don't need to cut, and sometimes the best decision about cutting is to not cut. You know what I mean? So on both sides of the spectrum, and even I remember the first time watching Gravity, where the opening scene's like 15 minutes long, like probably 12 minutes in, I'm like, I haven't cut yet. <laughs> but you know, I, I didn't I didn't realize it at all. You're so immersed in that story and the performances, and they're doing all this crazy stuff. You know, it's just, it's what I find interesting about editing is that it's like, you know, 2014, 2015, and it's like, there's still new editing techniques coming out. Like, this is, it's an old art, but it's like, you know, just this year. It's like they're progressing and they're telling stories in new ways, and that is exciting and, and fascinating to me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's still evolving, which is cool. Yeah. Um, speaking of new technology and new techniques, and Kind of and I know this is one of the questions we're going to get asked, but um, how important is the software that you use? Is, that, is there, um, and what's the difference between using professional grade software and, say, iMovie? And, like, does that affect your storytelling? Does that, is that just a tool? Like, you know, what, and what programs do you usually work on? Uh, I only cut on Final Cut 7. I, I never made a jump to Premiere or Avid. Um, I, at, at this point, I'm so fast on 7, it's just like, I've tried to learn. I mean, it's like, you know, the basics of like Premiere and like the basics of Avid, but to try to do something in there, it's like, it just take me forever. So it's like, I'll just convert the footage and I'll cut it in Final Cut 7. I, I personally don't think it matters at all, even using iMovie. It's like, you know, you can tell a story. It's like an iMovie project. And its most basic level is like the same thing as a Final Cut project. It's like it cuts and dissolves. You know what I mean? Like we're not doing anything fancy that is gonna blow you away in Final Cut Seven that you can't do. Anymore. So it's like to me, it doesn't matter. And just like you know, the same argument for cameras. Cameras don't matter in my opinion at all. You know what I mean? Um, it's about what you're doing with them and how you're telling the story. I think the same applies for editing. I think the software you use absolutely doesn't matter for the story you're telling. Um, on a and when you, if you do have a luxury of picking what you're using, you can always look at the specifics of the project and there's a lot of practical things in the workflow that come into play. If you know one, I think you can do any of them. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you are, if you have a target in mind of specifically like what you want to be doing, you can think about what is practically the most applicable program. For example, Avid is kind of a like mainstream industry standard, and if you're trying to get into that mainstream market, it's a good skill set to have. That's not to say that Avid makes better projects. You know, it really doesn't matter if you're talking creatively. If you're talking kind of like career goal set in mind, you know, you can always. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you just learn whatever you can learn, and then because five years is something brand new. <laughs> it's totally different. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it doesn't matter what you cut on. Like, really, I'm annoyed with all the programs right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's whatever one you're on, you miss the one you were on before. Well, like, all, the, <laughs> all an editing system needs to do a non like non linear editing system, like FileMaker could be the best non linear editing system. So all you need is an archive, a timeline, and a bunch of tools. Like, I, we should build our own open source non linear editing system, <laughs> not be slaves to corporations. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because they make decisions <laughs> for us. It's not fair. Yeah, well, and how expensive some things yeah. are, and like now they have a stupid renting thing. Like, with Premiere, I know. And Avid, you oh, yeah. right now too. Yeah. 
thing. No, I have this whole elaborate system of downloading trial versions and then downloading them again and like <laughs> you know, all these elaborate ways to get around it. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Come on anything. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Um, let's see, getting close to opening it up for Q&A here. Um, I think before we do that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, we have a really good like span of different types of editors here. We have documentaries and web and TV, news videos and commercials and narrative. And um, let's, I'd like to talk a little bit about like how much difference is there in between those third, or different mediums of film. Um, let's, uh, I'd like to talk about documentaries a little bit. Okay. So, Howard, I mean, I mostly work with docs, and right now I'm doing some TV work. Um, reality TV, just like docs and steroids. This. With docs, it's like, you, as an editor, you're like God. You have total control. Again, you're also dealing with real people that you're molding into characters, you know. So, um, a lot of it is digging through, for me, it's digging through, like, all the footage first, figuring out what exists there, what truth there is that exists in the footage, and then shaping that into a story that people will connect to that makes sense. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes I find that I build, I build characters out of real people, and then I show those characters to real people in, in a room, and they get to see themselves as a character, but they always see themselves as real people anyway. So you can, like, that, that could be sure. If you make a documentary about somebody, and you don't worry about how you're portraying them, you will never change the way that someone sees themselves. Ever. Really? Ever. Ever. I did it like I worked on a doc about a band that totally fell apart and imploded. I mean, we made one of the characters the horrible, most horrible villain. He was the reason the band imploded. He loved the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it. He didn't really, like even though he was I mean, there's bites of Rami ruined the band. Like he's a terrible person. He's like, I love it, it's great. <laughs> so yeah, don't be afraid of just telling the truth with documentaries. But yeah, the process is super long with docs because it's a lot of just revisions and revisions and revisions and shaping the story so that people who watch it understand what's going on. How, how beholden do you feel to like, the truth as you see it and post of what's most entertaining? Um, I like to say that I lie to tell the truth. <laughs> um, because uh, editing is nothing but lie. Like, you're literally taking a moment that doesn't, that, you're taking moments that didn't happen together and then putting them together. So it's a lie. But if you do it, if the intention is that you're doing it to reveal some sort of truth that happened, it's all okay. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all okay. <laughs> well, it is though, yeah. and then, like, that's how I. That's how I have to rationalize it, and that sounds very exclusionary. But it's like honestly, like because if I get stuck in the, oh, this didn't happen here, and this, you know, this isn't truthful. It's like no, the truth. What is it? Werner Herzog. You guys know Werner Herzog? Anyone? Um, the amazing German filmmaker. Um, he has this great quote that we, as, as filmmakers, we must not be annotators of truth, we must be organizers of truth. Meaning, like, it's not about telling what actually happened, it's about organizing the truth in, into something that means, that has meaning, you know, that means something to people. So, that's my two goals. Half expecting the Herzog impression. Yeah. As you heard. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Ask when Freddie comes on VFX. Freddie would do it. Ask him to do his burner Herzog. He thinks it's great. He must not be annotated as a proof. So poetic. What about rough video, Joey? What's well to segue into that? I, I would say that the last scene that I had to edit for Video Game High School Season Three was the reality show that opened the, the series. So the first scene was the last scene that I had edited. And, um, and it's a completely different style. I ruined it. I fucking, my first draft of the America's Next Top President, my first cut of that was, you know, 45 seconds shorter than it is in the show. Because I'm like, oh, well, as it happened in reality, as they did it, they had the lady going up, the nuclear launch codes and the final rose goes to the, pr and then, you know, Joe McHale comes in and all this stuff. And so, but what Matt did, he's like, no, no, no. He's like, the nuclear launch codes and then the poof, like cuts to the shot of the briefcase. And the final rose, boom, cuts to the shot of the rose. 
It basically they stretched out everything. Like everything that was a, that they said, they cut to it, and then they did so much drama. And I was like, what? Like my brain was like completely cutting like a, a, a show. Like a, it was a, it was a different show within the show that I was not like prepared for. So. I, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. But what a different style, like, already off the bat. Like, I ruined, like, I was way off the mark. And everything else was fine, but, but, but we weren't cutting a reality show at the time. It was season three was season three. Anyway. Um, but with, um, in regards to Webb and 5SF, what I've heard a lot as an editor, which is why I'm really happy with my background now at 5SF and my experience there is, you only have five seconds to, to tell a story. So every single frame counts. And, and a lot of notes that you'll hear from people is like, ooh, that could be tighter. Well, editing with 5SF, I naturally just suck the air out of everything. So like, it's as tight as it can get. Like, you, you cannot make this go faster. <laughs> people are constantly like, you know, you, you overlay dialogue a little bit just to squeeze it all in. And um, yeah, it's just amazing coming from just jumping around between different sort of formats within the web because it's everything. Mm -hmm. It's so, you're, you're constantly, you know, doing, I, I've been using the Van Damme splits as like a metaphor for a lot of things now ever since he did that thing with the trucks. But I feel like you're just doing the splits between all these different at, like parts of filmmaking and you're just, what is that, India? What is that music that he's doing? And then you're just, you're just calm about it, you're at peace and you just, you know, you're doing the splits and you're flying. You're flying, you're on those trucks, you're flying through the internet, and that is what, um, it's great for web editing. That's great for web editing, it's, it's if you could find that, that inner piece, like Van Damme. And, oh, and by the way, it's really funny, actually, is Van Damme is over our editing door, like, to go into our editing suite. It's a, it's a picture of Van Damme doing, like, a sweet kick, so, like, he's, he's a part of us. Yeah, he's our guardian. Um, what about uh, TV and editing episodic? TV scripted episodic is actually very, um, like, there's a very rigid hierarchy and it's very structured. And a lot of that, I think, comes from the mechanics of getting these episodes out and meeting air dates, and also all the unions are involved, and so everyone has, like, the regulated amount of time to work on stuff. And it's very much like passing the baton, and the editor is really the only person that stays through from start to finish. So editors have their cut, and they have their regular, like they have their amount of days that they, it's mandatory you give them. Then the director comes in, and they work on their cut. And it's very common in TV for the director to be kind of transient unless they're involved in the show in other ways, like a writer or a producer. So the director's gone after his or her cut. And then the producers come in, and they're really the keepers of the story, more so. And the producers do their cut. And then you go to the studio and the network, and it depends on your relationship, how much say they have. Like the show I'm on now, I don't really listen to them, <laughs> which is really nice, because normally you have to do all their stupid notes. But uh, <laughs> if there's a tumbler of like network notes, it's hilarious. Oh, it's network all, notes. It's <laughs> all the dumb notes. Uh, uh, you get yeah, network execs yeah. who don't know how film works, then you get some interesting Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so then yeah, after that, you go through, and then you, and then you walk in and do all the stuff. So, um, it's very, and there's, yeah, it's, I don't know, I guess maybe it's a little more old school in terms of like the hierarchy and the way things are expected to go and, you know, you, everyone has their turn to work on it and you're just kind of pressuring it along, keeping track of it, trying to like keep it good. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you for, I know you were doing a reality show and you've done music commercial um, videos and director editor. Yeah, the, the most interesting thing from an editing perspective is the stuff that I did for Katy Perry. So for her last tour, um, I wrote and directed this like six part story that broke up her concert into these just different little acts to have her you know, change costume or like different sets come in or whatever. Um, the thing that was interesting about it was that we had this little story going on, but we knew from the get we had three screens on the stage, right? So there's this one big main screen and these two peripheral screens. And we decided to show different content of the story on these screens at the same time. Which in theory, you're going in like, oh, this is going to be awesome. It's like, we'll show her here, we'll show a reaction there, we'll show like some set pieces here or there. And then you get down to cutting it, and you have to cut three screen things at once that are all synced together. And it just became this huge, like, recursive sequences of like, you know, like rendering all this stuff out and like to keep what was going on in your brain 
Um, it was a very tricky kind of thing to do. But it was really interesting because it was like it gave you this new sort of way to tell a story a little bit because you saw more than one screen at the same time. You saw more aspects of the story going on. So that was kind of like a fun and unique thing. Uh, and then just for like music videos, I guess, I always try to look at, um, you know, like a verse, chorus, verse is like the first act, second act, whatever, you know what I mean? So you kind of break it up. And um, I mean, music videos is like, you can kind of do whatever you want. You don't have to stick. Like, you can really do whatever you want in music video, you know what I mean? So I, I, it's been a great place to kind of like play and learn in. Um, you can tell a super rigid story, or you can just be all over the place, and it kind of doesn't matter. As long as it feels cool and looks cool, it'll probably be all right. How much do you work with artists in music videos? Like, do they come in and give you notes, or are you kind of like, I made this They, one? they, uh, a little both. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, because sometimes there's so much leeway, it's like, even in like pitches, I, I pitched music videos, like we, I did these four videos for Pink, and so the idea was like, okay, do like a circus carnival thing. And I was like, okay, so I came up with four different ideas of like these four videos of like different aspects of the carnival, sent it off, and then the only thing I got was, okay, cool. And I was like, okay, like, no, I'm not cool. That's all fine. Did you pick one? Didn't, didn't, didn't you pick one? No, no, we were doing four. Oh, you were doing four. Four. Okay. four. I wrote four, and then zero notes on all of them. Oh, oh, so I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or what. But then, Have you done it yet? Yeah, yeah well, this is years ago. Oh, okay. like, <laughs> and so we shot them, and for her in particular, they're like, her notes are like, she doesn't like how she looks in one shot. You know what I mean? Which I, which I get, and then we change that shot. So it's not, a lot, it's not too creative, but it depends on the artist. I know some artists are like really in the room, like, no, it changes, change that. But I think like their concerns, like anybody else, if like you watch yourself, you're like ah, I don't like that shot of me. You know what I mean? And that's kind of it. So it hasn't been too intense. Maybe I've been lucky. I don't know. Um, well, let's open up to some questions here. So, Gil, here you're going one up first. Uh, um, have you guys ever worked with another editor in the bay, in, in the editing bay? And how was that experience? Was it? Um, stifling was it, um, or did you kind of bounce off ideas off each other and help each other along the way? That whole uh, aspect of it. Yeah, all the time. Like almost every. I rarely work alone on docs because they take so long. Letters and like, I mean, it's just about building a relationship with somebody and figuring out what each person's strengths are, and then catering to those. Like. Like, I've worked with some editors that love doing big picture story stuff with docs. Because that's a lot of docs is like, you know, is the scene necessary? And so that person would like spend the day figuring out, like watching all, all the different scenes down and figuring out if they're right in the right order and why I go and do the nitty gritty about scene cutting or vice versa, you know? Um, with TV, it's always multiple editors or most of the time, so. Yeah. I love working with editors. Like I, I really enjoy collaborations. I mean, like on everything. Like I don't even like cooking by myself. <laughs> I, uh, I just, yeah. I, you know, unless the other person is like crazy, which I'm thinking, then you can work with crazy people. But it's just, I, yeah, it's really fun because it's just exciting. Like it's like you're both so excited about this thing, and you know, you're and give each other feedback and you create this even cooler thing than you could have done on your own. And it's like very comforting too, I think, because like you have someone on your team, you know, you're not by yourself and like, and if you have a good enough relationship, you can show them things that are precious that you're afraid for other people to see yet and like get their opinion on it. And yeah, I think it's great, you know, it's on, and it all goes back to the same things that, you know, we talked about working with directors, mutual respect and no ego and, you know, and if you need to work out ahead of time, how you're going to like divvy up the workflow, you can do that, or you can wing it. Kind of just depends on your personality. Mm -hmm. um, no um, like, how do you know what aspect ratio to use in a film? Uh, I guess if if no one tells you, <laughs> which <laughs> often is the case, like we need this in four three or you know whatever. I, I mean, I don't know. That's a that's a kind of good question. I mean. Usually someone would tell you. And then if you have the liberty to make the choice, whatever feels right, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, there's like, yeah, we, we shot a whole feature in 4.3, uh, and, and it was a specific choice for the style of film that we were going for. We wanted that VHS look, like that, that full frame, the square. Every, like everything I'd ever seen growing up was in that aspect ratio. Like so in video game high school, like I noticed like the, the aspect ratio changed at times. Like yeah, when yeah. 
Freddie and Matt wanted to shoot the whole action sequence at episode six at two, three, five, and a lot of our favorite movies, action movies specifically, are shot in that aspect ratio, and things just started looking more cinematic that way. Like once you start crushing it down from sixteen nine to like a little bit tighter, then then you watch Face Off again, and you're like, oh, like, geez, look at that boat <laughs> flip over there, and you know that's like the editing room that I'm in is we're talking about The Rock. You know, and stuff like that, and it all has that aspect ratio to it. So, you know, you just want to emulate the things that you like want to make within the, the style that you want to make it. And so, if those are their favorite action movies, then then their aspect ratio for their action scene is going to look the same way. You know, or at least format wise. That's usually a decision made with the director and the DP. Yeah. And sometimes it like they didn't think of it, and the, the it's like an edit. In post, it's like, hey, can we crop this and then can you reframe everything so it fits in the crop? And yeah, the editor's just like, I don't know, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're losing all the precious pixels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more questions. Are you here? Hi, um, I'm a writer, director, I mainly do that. I also edit, but um, one of my friends, he's a, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine, and he's a really talented editor, editor uh, mainly in After Effects. And sometimes, really hard to work with them and I, I'm just because we recently did a project where it, it was um, an action sequence where it was supposed to be done in all in one shot so just stop right now so I it was supposed to be all in one shot and he wasn't very specific um, on he because I was the director and he was the cameraman and he was I was he, I was trying to get him to do what I wanted to do and so how do I get that across to him without coming off like a total jerk <laughs> Well, I mean, it's like you can ask someone to do something without being a dick about it, you know what I mean? But it depends, because it's like, there's two things, right? Is there's the, the question of, are you being clear enough to him? Or is there some aspect of him being difficult that is resisting that communication, you know what I mean? And I think, because that's the whole thing as far as directing, it's like for me, it's like, I need to make sure I am clear to everybody, you know what I mean? Everybody knows like what is going on in my head, because that's ultimately what's happening. Like, I have this thing in my head, and I, and I somehow need to like get all these people to be on that same page, so we can all make this thing in my head, you know what I mean? And so it's really my job to communicate exactly what I want, and sometimes, you know, you meet people and you really connect with them, and you, you know, you're on the same page, and some people aren't, and it's just about, for you wanting to direct, it's about, you figuring out what you can do on your side. You can't make him listen, you know what I mean? You can't make him be less difficult, but you can think about how you can communicate or how you can deal with his personality in a way that gets it closer to what you want. You know what I mean? Um, and that's, that's just all, just all you can do, you know? Why not? Um, I saw you were going to go up before. Yeah. Um, how would you recommend getting internships or um, starting positions for people who have recently graduated from film school? Access the community you're interested in. You know, if you're interested in something very specific, find panels, meetup groups, uh, you know, mixers, podcasts. Just like delve into the community of that. Every area has its own community, and meet people within it and talk to them. And also, like, show, like, it, it, like, when you get your first job, like, as an assistant or whatever, show, like, real path. Like, editors love people that want to edit. Like, like, I thought, like, when I was an assistant long, like, a little while ago, like, years ago, like, I met this great editor named Mason Rosenfield, who saw that in me that I loved editing because when I pulled selects for him, I cut them together like they were a scene. He's like, you have to do that. Like, I just want to pull selects. But he saw that I loved it. And he like, gave me a job back. So that's important, you know. We love passion. Yeah, I mean, I would also, it's, it's kind of one of those things like take as many jobs as you can right off the bat because you never know what best friends you're going to make. And that's like, that's one of my big takes. Yeah, like, don't be too good for something early yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to, I mean, even if you, you are never going to work with that director again, you might need an assistant or a PA or someone who's like, shares the same like nerdy, awesome things that you like. So, um, more questions. Um, you and then you. What do you consider to be a motivated cut? Things like cutting off action, is there any other things that you would say, like, this is what you should cut? Uh, I, you just sort of feel out the scene, really. Um, I do 
like when things like sort of cut on action, but also it's it really depends. Like sometimes I, I feel like it, it, it's still with, when you're cutting on action, you gotta be like you gotta shave frames like very specifically, and that's the type of care that I like seeing go into editing. But it also might be just as effective if if a person instead of cutting on them sitting down, you just let them sit down and then they're still and then you cut it to like like there's like that's still a motivated cut. It's it, you just have to justify it to yourself and, and what you and what you think whenever whenever it feels right. For me, um, story is king. Yeah. It's what do you what's the story of being told? I I would say like if you could describe to yourself why you cut. That's the motivation. Yeah. yeah. But I did it because I wanted to emphasize his reaction to the guy who showed up, who appeared in the group. Sometimes you don't always know why, but if you really feel like you should, then you Well, like, I think it's cool to like know, like that's like understanding the mechanics of why you're editing. I think is important, especially if you're working with directors. So when they go, why did you do that? You're like, I did it because I needed to get a reaction, and I want the audience to see that. Yeah. yeah. I I was talking to John Sam about it a little bit. We were talking about that specifically, and he. He and I both sort of came to the, the general agreement that we like cutting to close-ups like only when the, that matters. Like if this water bottle right now is the only thing that could save the world, and I tell you that, and then like we both cut, then then you cut to the freaking water bottle, you know, and you cut to a close. -up. You don't cut to a close-up of a guy just like unlocking his door. It doesn't matter. I mean, you can if that's what you want. It's like cool for the style or to you know whatever, but most of the time, we don't like seeing close-ups unless it visually tells a story, and that's what helps, like, if you watch a movie on view, is you're showing, like, you're showing what's what's important, and that's yeah. motivated. Yeah. We have you and then Madison. Um, when would you use L-cuts? I'm sorry? Um, L-cuts, like, um, when it's, like, it cuts on a scene, but, like, the audio is still, like, in the scene. Mm -hmm. Are you just asking like when to use them or? Yeah, won't get like. Uh, well, I guess the same kind of thing. I guess whenever it feels right, it, it, there's no like technical thing, and I think that's a big thing that we've been saying this whole time is that there's no one specific way. But I think it's good too to like, like try it, try it on like the next twenty cuts that you do, and like see what it works and see if it doesn't. You know what I mean? And like you'll start to develop an experience for like, oh, like here in this one instance, it was good. You know what I mean? I find that it's not terribly common. Do a J cut a lot more often, but I don't know, just whatever, you know, if you find it works, it, it works. There's a single way to do it. And you should use them all the time. <laughs> I'm serious. All, all cuts are king. At least for documentaries, because it's like that's that's what I always use, all cuts. Because it's like just it's like when you're doing a documentary, you're interview you know, you have a lot of interview rights and you have to show stuff while people are talking yeah. talking. So it's you show interesting things while people are talking and then that's how you create meaning, you know. Mm -hmm. so on the style and what project you're on. Um, uh, what is your relationship with the director? Does he come into the booth and is there watching you edit, or does he just show up and you say, here it is, but great, and how much time do you actually spend with them when they're actually filming? I get kicked out of it anyways. <laughs> 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 um, partially because I, I just, but I know because it's you are an editor. Because I am an editor, but I know too. Like you know, I've edited a bunch of stuff with other people, sort of like in direction. And it's like I hate having that over my shoulder. It's like let me just work. You know what I mean? Like you go away, I'll work, and that'll be. And I get so people are like, okay, I'm gonna get out of here. Um, so, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. There, there, again, there's no set thing. But usually, it's like you'll pow out and talk about what you want to do, and they will do a cut, and the director will come in and watch it. So I guess it's probably as least time as possible you want people around you. <laughs> I think it's totally different from the director. My personal preference is a hybrid where, you know, there are times where I like them in the room because there's certain paper notes that just you have to, because you're trying to find a way to get to what they really want, and there's other times where it's just exhausting. Uh, Freddie and Matt were um, editing and their director, so I would cut a scene. That was probably the best freedom that I had, is they didn't, oh, they weren't sort of judging or critiquing me over the shoulder as I worked. I would cut the scene, and they were very good about me being able to just get in the zone and just figure it out myself, and then show them what I had. And, and then they would take it from there. So that's, it's also good to like have directors who are editors and speak the same language as you, and all that stuff, because you could, you could be like, hey, what do you think of this? director 
might be like, ah, or they might really like it, and then you make their life easier. Because then you just keep going. Good luck. Yeah. I hate driving in that room. <laughs> <laughs> well, because like for me, it's I, I see my job as an editor as like being the first audience for the movie. And if, if a director's there, especially if it's a narrative, then they are seeing all everything that they love about the footage, and, and, and that's affecting the way that I'm seeing it, so I can't be an audience member. So, like, I need to get them out of the room and then make a cut, make a scene, and then bring them in and say, what do you think of this? And then they say, I hate it. And you go, okay, I'll fix it. And you As a director, you should definitely let your editor do a full cut before you come in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have to trust them. You have to. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't find them, editor. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't, yeah. Alright, I saw before your hand was up. Um, um, how long do you take to uh, edit, or how much time out of your day do you take to just edit? I mean, I don't know. Put the question. My times I have forever. I, I will never be done. Yeah. <laughs> it takes forever. Yeah. It really yeah, does. Lunch just to edit. Even yeah. if you're a fast editor, it, you're never quite done until it's done, and then you're but yeah. you're while you're working on it. I mean. It's your life. That's the director's job. Yeah. Come in and be like, okay, you're, it's, it's done now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, sorry, mom, I'll call you back. Like, <laughs> I'm right now. I'm foof, and every there's no there. The world could come down outside. I'm just, you know. Do you I have that time pressure? Huh? Any pressure on you guys? Oh, deadlines? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Or not. Yeah. Like, I'm doing rather a TV right now, and there's tons of deadlines, and I have to give myself like I'm gonna cut this scene in an hour. And if it's not done then, I, I die. You know, and I have to get it. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll take forever because it's never, you never finish. Yeah. Do you lie to yourself? Oh, I lie to myself. Like, I'm like spending an hour on this, and then four hours later, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do, but I, yeah, it's hard. I know. You gotta, yeah, there's, there's a certain self. Uh, and it's not proportionate to the footage. You can spend hours on the like tiniest amount of footage and then like whip something together to have tons of footage. Yeah, it's really 